some craft. For thee, the market strong with many a slay. Mad talk. Like boys with toys. I know, was there ever a more clickbaity title than ranking the women of James Bond? I get it, but you know what? We're waiting for Bond 25, No Time to Die. It's coming out in a few months, so we're holding off on a couple other ranking videos. So I figured, well, what the hell? Let's do this. We've talked about it for so long. Why not? Question for real James Bond fans. Was there ever a subject that was more misunderstood? Casual fans of James Bond will tell you that the women in these films are there to be sexy. They're there to excite and titillate, but I would argue that is so far from the point. The women in these films are smart, they are capable. They inspired a generation of young men to look beyond the surface, to find women that incorporate all of these great qualities, and no one did it better than the women of the James Bond films. And what's this minus Vesper and Tracy? Well, the bottom line is, you know they're my top two. My top 10 list would really just be a top eight list because you'd be waiting for the Fab Two, Bond's true loves Vesper and Tracy to take the top spots. So I figure, let's just put it out there. Vesper and Tracy are easily the top two Bond women of all time, the two women that James Bond fell in love with. So for the sake of keeping things interesting, Vesper and Tracy get the trophy, now let's do a top 10. So let's do this. Let's talk about my top 10 James Bond women. I'm going to cheat a little bit. You'll see what I mean. Uh, I'll talk about a few that I think are not so great. Uh, a couple runners up and everything in between. So let's jump into this. Let's start with a few that I think don't work out too well. This one is not exactly a surprise because I think everyone kind of agrees. This character does a 180 halfway through the film. Starts out pretty smart, tough, resourceful, and by the end, she's a complete bimbo. Hi, Ernst. Is Superman giving you any trouble? Just put her in a bikini and everything she touches turns to hijinks. Such nice cheeks too. If only they were brains. Now, two things that should go without saying. One, even our least favorite Bond girls are great. Keep leading on that tutor, Charlie, and you're gonna get a shot in the mouth. All Bond girls are memorable, they're all fun, always beautiful, but sometimes they fall short due to bad writing. And the other thing is, this has nothing to do with the actress. I think Jill St. John is a classic, and quite frankly, she's always got good things to say about being a Bond girl. So again, great actress, but I think most Bond fans will admit this is a case where the character could have been handled better. This is another weird one, and it really has to do with her place in the film. Now talk about a character that doesn't get much to do. The film starts out with a pretty strong, smart, attractive Bond woman that is again highly capable, puts one over on James Bond once or twice, but is kind of unceremoniously done away with just so we can bring in another Bond girl at the 11th hour. The idea of Bond turning Japanese, taking on a wife to blend in with the local culture, it's kind of a big deal in the movie, but in the big scheme of things, it doesn't really amount to anything. Think again, please. So what you end up with is a character that's technically the main Bond girl. I mean, her name is Kissy Suzuki. She is the character from the original Fleming novel. But again, she's just so wasted. She barely speaks in this. So yeah, I think she's kind of best known for being an oddity of the Bond canon. Come on, you knew this was gonna be here. Yeah, sorry, I just, I, I just can't get used to this one. Now again, I don't blame the actress even though I think she's kind of overrated. I really do blame the director on this one. You can't just tell an actor to be badass and expect it to happen. You need good dialogue, good storytelling, and this one's got none of that. So you just get another Bond's equal type character who's badass at some points. <laughs> the damsel in distress at other points. Just kind of a weird mishmash of a character and really only memorable for some bad dialogue. Your mama. 
So my list of runners up has to start with Sylvia Trench. Come on. Not only the original very first Bond girl, but still the only Bond girl, at least for now, to show up in two Bond films. I mean, seriously, this was Bond's steady girl for a while there. Something we've never seen since. And depending on who you ask, is really who the Paris Carver character is supposed to be. Just kind of interesting that we saw James Bond with a steady squeeze in the beginning, so you gotta give it to Sylvia. I think Electric King is, well, she's real close to being a great Bond girl. This was almost the perfect personification of the winged dove type that Fleming spoke of. You could really understand how she could get under James Bond's skin. You can understand how he'd be torn, almost tortured, trying to figure out who he can trust. If anything, this was kind of a precursor to Vesper. Bond is so taken that he's understandably played, at least for a while. The twist of her being the real bad guy is well played. The performance gets a little soap opera for me, but still, I think this is executed really well. And Sophie Marceau is a great actress. She does a great job and she's very believable in the part. What I love so much about Melina is that she's a character with her own story. She feels like a flesh and blood person with real motivations who doesn't just sort of switch on when James Bond is in the room. She's off doing her own thing regardless of what James Bond is doing. She's very intertwined in the story. Calvin said in one of his reviews that he didn't really understand why James Bond was lecturing Melina about revenge. Bond kills people all the time, so why does he get on her for doing it? But that's just it, Bond is already broken. He's saying, don't make the mistakes I've made. Don't lose a part of your soul to revenge. I think it works. This one I'm throwing in there simply as a guilty pleasure. One, I love that this part of the film, this particular pre-title sequence, works as its own mini-movie, and I love that. So this particular sequence has its own Bond girl, and she plays several parts. She's integral to Bond's escape, doing exactly what a female spy would be doing in this situation. And frankly, she's just stunning. So I really wanted to give this one a mention. This one's a bit of a cheat, and you'll see some more cheating going forward, but I'm going to call my last one a tie between Paula and Zora, both played by the legendary Martine Beswick, who I think who really is just a staple of the Bond films. That exotic look, she was just born to be a Bond girl. Really helped to make the series what it is. All right, let's do this. Let's jump into the best James Bond girls of all time. Uh, just a note. I'm not going to put M on this list. I'm not going to put Money Penny on this list. Uh, again, they're they're great characters. They support Bond. Bond couldn't complete his mission without them, of course. Uh, but they're there for different purposes. So I'm going to stick to just the traditional Bond women. All right, let's jump into the main list now. This is number ten. A uh, little bit of a cheat right out of the gate. Number 10 is a two-way tie. Uh, I put these two together because I feel like they, they serve very similar roles. And I feel like the kind of reaction I get from them, both very similar. Uh, you'll see what I mean when I get into it. So again, number 10 is a two-way tie. We've got Severine and Lucia. So the reason I put these two together is probably pretty obvious. I get a very similar overall vibe from both characters. Both have very similar parts in the story. Both are connected to an evil organization that Bond is trying to get to. And the overall feel is kind of the same. In both cases, I feel like we just didn't get enough time with these two. Severin, played by the stunning Bernice Merlot, is hauntingly beautiful. Definitely has that exotic look that a Bond girl should have. But she's damaged in that Fleming sort of way. So she's exciting, we want to get to know her better, but it's cut off way too quickly. And dare I say in a way that's not exactly satisfying. <sighs> it's a waste of good scotch. But again, she's got an incredible presence on screen. I want to spend more time with this character, so she's in the top 10. Monica Bellucci's Lucia serves a very similar purpose. Again, absolutely stunning. Monica Bellucci should have been in a James Bond film years ago. So it's great to finally get her in here. Her scenes are spectacular. Bond rescuing her from the hitman has got to be one of the highlights of this film. But again, it's very familiar. Bond is using her to get to the criminal organization. And as with her predecessor, we don't get to spend nearly as much time with her as we wish. If there's anything unique about the Lucia character is that they finally break the very consistent pattern of the sacrificial lambs. But unfortunately, the character just goes away never to be seen again. And again, I think we could have done more with this character. But again, the fact that I want to see more of these characters tells me that I really like them and respond to them. So with that, they successfully made it to the 10 spot. 
Jumping into number nine, again, the beauty is offset only by very incredible ability, plus the role she plays in the film, I think, is is quintessential James Bond, frankly. Uh, you'll know what I'm talking about in a few seconds. Number nine is Magda. Now, everyone knows I hold this film in a very high regard. But this character, this interaction, is a great example of why I feel that way. This is classic espionage. This is classic intrigue. This harkens back to the early days. Two people trying to play each other to get what they want, to get information. And Magda played by the stunning Christina Wayborn. You can see why she would be sent to seduce James Bond to retrieve the stolen treasure. From the moment she walks into the auction, you totally understand why she would turn Bond's head. She's stunning. She's got this captivating look that just draws you in. So honestly, I find this whole scene of her seducing Bond, I find it to be very believable. I love the byplay, the back and forth, and her escape from Bond's room. I mean, this is classic, and this shows us something about her character, about her background. This whole scene is such a great moment in the film. Very James Bond, very Ian Fleming. She's a great character and really elevates the film, so I've got to call her my number nine. Number eight is very similar in terms of uh, being a quintessential Bond character. Uh, this character makes you think of espionage, interrogation. Uh, so let's talk about her, Solange. Now this one could have easily slipped into the same category as Severin and Lucia. Very similar in terms of her place in the story. Beautiful, exotic, kept woman that Bond has to go through to get information about the bad guy. This one definitely started that pattern, but I think she comes off much better. She's a much more fleshed out character. Played by the gorgeous Katarina Monroe, she's obviously stunning. She's got that exotic Bond girl look. So we want to be in Bond's shoes as he seduces her to try to get information. But again, I feel like we just get to know her just a little bit better. I'll attribute that to the good writing. I think the screenplay really works here. The little teasing that Bond does to try to get under her skin, it strikes me as very realistic. I'm on board with this, I'm buying it. And even though we part ways with this character early on, I think the way that Bond ends it is kind of an interesting twist. In a standard Bond film up until this point, Bond would have gone to bed with the girl and emerged the next morning with his information, but Bond cutting out early was pretty new. This interaction is sort of a statement on the film in general. It turned a couple of those Bond tropes on its head, causing us to look at these same tropes in a very different light, through different lenses. So yeah, I think this character just comes off better. She's exciting. We want to get to know her better. Her dialogue is great. I mean, I just love it. So what can I say? She's my number eight. Number seven is another cheat. This is another two-way tie, but again, you'll kind of understand why I went this way when you hear uh, who I'm talking about. Uh, they, they, in my mind, they work together as a pair, even though they don't share any screen time together. Who am I talking about? Jill and Tilly Masterson. The reason I love these two together as a duo is because of how smartly each character is written. And frankly, I think they're both cast perfectly. When we meet Jill, she's got a lot of sass. She's got spunk. You could see her as being the wild child who got drawn in with the wrong crowd. She's a victim of some bad choices, and it ultimately gets her in trouble. Tilly, on the other hand, comes across as the good girl. She's the one who stayed out of trouble. So when she goes off on this hell-bent tear to get revenge on Goldfinger, of course it's not gonna go right because she's not that kind of girl. She's a nice girl who got in over her head. So it's the offset between the two characters that I think works so well. You can see the difference in each sister. And again, perfectly cast. One looks a little more wild, one looks much more innocent. And I just love that dynamic. And because of that dynamic, each one plays a part in the story. Bond interacts with each one differently because they're different people serving different purposes. And I think it just goes to show how smart the screenplay is, that they treated both of these characters differently. They offset each other. They're a perfect yin and yang. I just think it really works. Now, number six might come as a surprise. Uh, it's not one of my favorite films, but I feel that this character is pretty unquestionable in terms of ability and, and just great presence. Uh, this is somebody that, again, we admire her because Bond admires her. Who am I talking about? From You Only Live Twice, Aki. 
I kind of highlighted this one earlier when I talked about my least favorite Bond girl, Kitsu Suzuki. Aki stands out as being the one who was in control. I think this was kind of a different take on the Bond girl at this point. She's not just pulled into the story by mistake. She's not a damsel in distress. This was one of the first times we saw an ally who just happened to be one of the Bond girls. And she's smart. She's capable. She gives Bond a run for his money, frankly. Bond is very complimentary about her capabilities. I remember the first few times I saw this film being kind of surprised at Bond's reaction when he meets her later. It's pretty apparent that Bond is pretty impressed with her. He's impressed on multiple levels and she's very involved with what's going on. She's not just there to take orders, she's hands-on. She gets Bond out of a fix more than once. And frankly, she's got that exotic Far East look. So this was really a different kind of Bond girl at this point. She was kind of doing that Bond's equal thing before it got carried away and became a cliche. She didn't need help keeping up. She does fine on her own. So yeah, the word that keeps coming to mind is impressive, so she's my number six. We're in the top five, the top five Bond women of all time. Uh, again, just personal opinion, uh, but this one, I think for most Bond fans, she was just so striking, just had such an incredible presence. And again, quintessential to the plot of the story. Uh, again, this is, this is not a character that can just kind of come and go. Uh, this one is integral to what's happening in this story. Uh, so let's talk about her. Number five is Solitaire. What is it about Solitaire that makes her so popular amongst Bond fans? She's not one of the ones that you would call strong or capable in the usual sense, but maybe that's just it. Maybe it's because she's so vulnerable. She's held captive. It makes us just want to rescue her. Maybe that's what makes her the sweetheart of the Bond films. Played by the ever gorgeous Jane Seymour. I mean, she's just captivating. We can understand why Bond wants to rescue her and take her away from all that. It's a cliche older than time. And maybe that's why she garners extra sympathy. She's actually played by Bond. He takes advantage. He pulls a fast one and strips her of her powers. Do we feel guilty on his behalf? So maybe we're rooting even more for Bond to rescue her? And this is one of the more fascinating films in terms of this character does deal in the supernatural. And we're never really sure if her powers are legit or maybe just the characters around her believe it is. But do we believe in her powers as the viewers? Is the film saying something about the supernatural? So she really is pretty unique in the Bond world. She doesn't fit perfectly into any of the existing templates. She broke the mold of the Bond girl. I think maybe that's why she's the favorite of so many and that's why she's my number five. So number four, we're getting into the top four. So we are starting to get into the iconic Bond women. Uh, we are talking about staples in James Bond legend. Uh, and this one, honestly, probably one of the most memorable. Uh, ask any casual fan or people who are not fans of James Bond. They'll all know this one. Who am I talking about? One of the most incredible scenes in film history belongs to Honey Rider. But like I said, the word here is iconic. This is one of the most famous introductions in cinema history. This entrance might very well be why we have James Bond today. Ursula Andress broke the mold. This was not the typical Hollywood starlet of the day. She was athletic. She was lean. She was sexy in a new exotic sort of way. This was the kind of girl who was going to keep up with James Bond. Someone Bond would find exciting. Someone he wants to get to know. This was our first look at that winged dove that Ian Fleming was so fascinated with. Beautiful, but slightly damaged. Strong, but needed James Bond's protection, but can still hold her own. Mess with her and you might get a tarantula in your tent. And while she doesn't even enter the story until pretty late in the game, her presence is just so powerful. How could she not be in my top four? I mean, what else can I say about Honey Rider? She is a classic and the Bond films just would not be the same without her. Uh, this one might take the prize for the most iconic Bond girl of all time. We knew her because she was smart, because she was capable and she gave Bond a run for his money and she was so integral to the plot. I mean, the plot really does, uh, particularly the resolution of the plot, really does hinge on this character and Bond's relationship with her. Who else could I be talking about? Pussy Galore.
Now this one was a giveaway. You know she's gotta be on any list of top 10 Bond women of all time. She really did break the mold. If Sean Connery's James Bond was to go off into the sunset with one of his leading ladies, I think it's gotta be pussy galore. The way she's played by Honor Blackman, tough, no nonsense, but still feminine and can still give in to Bond's charms. I mean, was there ever a more capable heroine on film? She's a pilot, she runs her own fleet, the flying circus, that's all pussy galore. She's integral to the plot. She's integral to Operation Grand Slam. But she's not only key to the story, but she's essential to Bond saving the day. Bond has to win her over. It is she who gets word to the authorities because of James Bond. So the whole romance between James Bond and Pussy Galore, it's not some side plot just to keep things interesting. It is a key component to the story, if not the key component. This is how James Bond foils Goldfinger's plot by winning over Pussy Galore. Lore. So not only is she beautiful, not only is she a strong, interesting Bond girl, but she's essential to the story. She is the core. She is the linchpin that saves the day. So she may be one of the most important Bond girls that's ever been in terms of her place in the story. So naturally she's in my top three. We're in the top two. We're in the top two and we're getting into what I would call my more personal favorites. Uh, these are the ones that, for me personally, really stood out uh, and kind of made me remember the movie uh, as much for the romance in the film than anything else. So with that in mind, again, this one uh, it just kind of struck a personal chord with me. Uh, it's one of the reasons why I like this film so much, because I think the romance works. And again, she's hardly the most outspoken Bond girl. Uh, she might even be sort of the polar opposite of that. Uh, but again, she sort of falls into what Ian Fleming used to refer to as the winged dove archetype. So again, the romance in this film is really why it works for me. So I have to give it to Kara Malovi. I know, I know, my credibility just took a pretty sizable hit. This was the moment when you said, head of section, you just done and lost me, but hear me out. They don't always have to be capable. They don't always have to be strong. They don't always have to be Bond's equal. Sometimes the damsel in distress is okay. Sometimes they've been taken advantage of and they just need rescuing. And sometimes that's what I want. Sometimes I just need some old school rescuing. But I think it goes even beyond that. First of all, she's right out of Fleming's short story. The Living Daylights was a short story about James Bond taking out a sniper, a classic Cold War tale. So when they evolved the story into something larger, what a great idea to make the sniper a victim of a larger conspiracy. So Bond is suddenly playing a role, playing to her good nature. That's old school espionage. Bond is being a spy, he's being a double agent, playing a part, trying to find out what she knows, trying to get information. But in the process, she gets under his skin. He lets his guard down. And I love the idea that he gets angry at himself because of it. He's so taken with her that he takes his eye off the ball. Again, this is a concept that we've seen before and we'll see it played out again. So I think she's very similar to some of the great Bond girls. Not an earth-shattering romance, but a very believable romance. Cara Malovi played by the beautiful Miriam Dabo. I can totally understand that James Bond would be taken with this girl. I love that she has dreams and ambitions, fleshing out her character even more. I can totally see Bond wanting to go off into the sunset with this one. And by the way, even though I'm not really focusing too hard on it, she does get a story arc. While her character has been the victim of a lot of manipulation up until this point, she finally gets involved. She starts to take some action. But again, this is a point that they don't slap you across the face with either. I love that you can genuinely see the frustration on Bond's face sometimes. But again, she comes through. Not in that, hey, look at me, I'm Bond's equal kind of way, but it's in a way that I find reasonably believable. So again, probably not a lot of people's favorite, probably not one of the most memorable to many people. But again, I think the believable romance in this film is one of the reasons why it really pulls me in. I just really see her as somebody Bond could fall for. So that's why she's so high on my list. And number one, uh, you can be sure that it's going to be a personal favorite. Uh, not everybody might agree with this one, uh, but again, it's 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 a personal choice. Uh, it, it's one that uh, some will probably say that I'm I'm falling a little back a little too hard on nostalgia for this one, but uh, I, I will make a very strong case that I believe 
the the romance is what I find. I think it's one of the most believable romances in the whole franchise. Uh, again, I'm not saying it's Bond's uh, greatest loves like Vesper and Tracy, um, but it's. I find it to be very believable in terms of this is the kind of person that I would see James Bond uh, falling for, um, and especially the kind of romance that involves uh, a mutual respect. Uh, so frankly, I think of all of uh, Roger Moore's romances, I feel like this is the one I could see him going off into the sunset with somebody that he is the most compatible with, who is very smart, very capable as he is, um, but also very sensual in her own way. Uh, and again, this is not uh, Bond in his younger years. This is Bond in, in his older years. So I find this match to be a very perfect pairing. You probably guessed it by now. Who am I talking about? Octopussy. Okay, did I go off the rails completely again? A lot of people are going to say that Joe is way too nostalgic for this film, but we already covered the bases of the most iconic Bond girls, and I've already said that Vesper and Tracy would still be higher. So here's another one that will just chalk up to personal preference, but honestly, there's good reason why I've always considered this to be one of the most classic, the most underrated of Bond films, and I think the romance that happens with this character is one of those reasons. Octopussy is like Pussy Galore in that she is capable, she is smart, she's demonstrated it. She runs her entire operation, she's got an army of women willing to do her bidding. She's a smart, capable businesswoman. And that's why I find her to be so believable as Bond's contemporary. Played by the incredible Maude Adams, this is the second time she's played a Bond girl opposite Roger Moore. So age-wise, it makes perfect sense. They didn't try to pair Roger Moore with a younger Bond girl. Roger Moore was a seasoned agent at this point. So I find the pairing to be very believable. They seem compatible. They seem natural together. And I like that they wrote this character with some backstory. I like that they went back to the original Fleming material to flesh out this connection that she already has with James Bond. They use the subtle touch of Ian Fleming to form this friendship. And then as they get to know each other more, you can see how it would go to the next level. It would blossom into something more. However, you do also ask yourself, is Bond genuinely falling for her? Or is he pressing her because he needs information, because he needs her allegiance? Is this old school espionage? Or are there genuine feelings here? Is it a little of both? What starts out as a sweet distraction for an hour or two turns into something much more. And honestly, I'm just buying it. I totally believe that these two would end up together. And that's half the battle. I have to believe that the romance unfolding feels natural. And by the way, similar to what I said about Pussy Galore, Bond's ability to win her over becomes an essential part of the story. It's what helps him crack the case and save the day. Octopussy is the one that helps Bond save the day. If he didn't convince her, if she didn't believe that he was being authentic, she wouldn't have risked everything for this moment. If he was not successful in winning her over, he would not have succeeded in this mission. So again, I think every Bond actor has that one co-star who most likely he would go off into the sunset with. And for Roger Moore, I think it's Octopussy. Again, she's not quite up there with Vesper and Tracy, but honestly, I think she incorporates all the great things we want in a Bond girl. This was the right Bond girl for this Bond actor at this moment in his tenure. This James Bond is seasoned and experienced, and he needs a leading lady who is similar. I think it's firing on all cylinders, so call me crazy, but this one is my number one. So there you go. We finally ranked my uh, top favorite Bond women of all time and a couple not so favorites, and we talked about why. Uh, again, I probably feel like while we're waiting for No Time to Die, uh, and I'll probably wait to do my ranking of the Craig films, my ranking of all the Bond films, top, bottom, etc., um, why not do a couple fun ones that I never really got around to? Uh, Bond women, we could talk about villains, locations, that sort of thing. Uh, why the hell not? Let's have a little fun while we wait for no time to die in October, hopefully. Um, so there you go. Again, let me know what you thought about this list. Am I crazy? Uh, who are your favorites? Please put them in the comments. Please subscribe. Please like the video, all that good stuff. Uh, once again, this is your good buddy, Head of Section. This is being James Bond, and we'll be back with more videos soon. Keep it coming. Let me know what you want to see more of. And until then, keep on living like James Bond.